Hey, thanks for dropping by and checking out this message. These lessons come from our Sunday gatherings at Victory Christian Church in Franklin, Indiana. Our 5th through 8th graders meet at 9 or 10.30 a.m. and our high schoolers meet from 6 to 8 p.m. If you find that this content brings value to your life, then please consider subscribing and hitting that bell so that you can be notified when we upload our next message. Our hope is that this video brings more clarity into your life as to who God is and what He wants for you in light of who Jesus is and what He's done for you. Enjoy and have a great day. How are we doing? Good? Okay, okay. You guys awake? <laughs> Some of you are just like yelling things, but cool. Glad you guys are here this morning. We're so glad that uh, this is an opportunity that you chose to come and worship with us and have fun and just uh, hear from God's Word this morning. So um, we're actually starting a brand new series today called Worth Repeating. And the reason that we're going to repeat some messages that maybe you heard growing up is because they're messages that have been repeated all throughout the last 2,000 years. They're messages that Jesus himself told, and he told them because, go figure, they're worth repeating. But the question is why? Why were they worth repeating? And I think it's because every time we hear them, there's something new that we can get out of them. There's something new that can resonate in our lives, and there's something that God is trying to teach us through these stories that Jesus told. Have you guys ever heard something that your, your parents maybe say or a coach says or a teacher that just like it's their go-to phrase they say over and over again? And like whenever you hear a word or a phrase that mimics what they say, you can't hear it without hearing their voice inside your head. Yeah? You guys know what I'm talking about? Like, like my dad. He, he would always say this thing um, growing up, you know, daddy's ears are funny. I can't hear you when you use your whiny voice. And so anytime I was complaining about anything or, you know, I, I was frustrated at a decision or something, he goes, oh, I'm sorry, daddy's ears are funny. He can't hear you when you use your whiny voice. And it was one of those things that drove me insane. And I, I still, like, coming out of my mouth, it makes my blood boil just a little bit because it's one of those phrases that I can't say it or, or hear it without hearing my dad's voice, usually from the front of the car or, like, you know, where are we going to eat? You know, I don't want McDonald's again. Oh, daddy's ears are funny. Can't hear you when you use your whiny voice, right? And, and, and so sometimes, you know, even, even today as an adult, they'll come and visit and we'll be like, I don't want Chicago's again. My dad grew up in Kokomo. And so like, like the breadsticks remind him of his childhood. And so he, he's like, we didn't have Chicago's, but the pizza place we had had breadsticks exactly like these. And so every time he comes, he's got to get breadsticks like five times. And so like, I don't want breadsticks again. Oh, daddy's ears are still funny. He can't hear you when you use your whiny voice. You know, and it's one of those phrases that just, oh, it's just one of those. And you guys have those where people say things, and, and no matter how many times they say them, you, you remember them. Before they even start the phrase, you probably know what's about to come out of their mouth, right? And these stories are, are like that in some ways, but not like that in other ways. These stories that Jesus told were like that in ways that, like, it changed people's expectations, and when he said them, people remembered them. Okay? People remember them so well. In fact, they wrote it down in documents called the Gospels, and we read them to this day 2,000 years later. So they were worth repeating, worth remembering, and but it probably didn't have the annoying factor for most of his audience when he told these stories. And it's, it's these things that, like, when, whenever he says them, it would, it would be like it would start out as something typical that people would, like, expect in a story, like a once upon a time or something. We, we hear that and we expect a story. You know, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, we expect a certain kind of story. And Jesus would begin his stories in a way that sounded familiar, that people, you know, were nodding to. And then all of a sudden there'd be a twist and people would be like, what? what? No, that's not, how, that's not how that goes. That's not how that's supposed to go, right? You ever had somebody ruin a story for you and tell it the way that it's not supposed to go? And you're like, oh, it doesn't go that way. Those were the stories that Jesus told. But before we, before we get there, I just have a question for you guys. Have you ever lost anything before? Yeah? You guys lost stuff? Yes. Who went? I'm talking to middle schoolers. Of course you guys have, right? <laughs> Just kidding. I've been in middle school, and sometimes I still am. And, and I, know what, I know what it's like. You lose things all the time. And, and, and sometimes if you're like my wife, then you still lose things, and you ask me, and I don't know, right? But, but I used to have a lost and found here where, like, probably, I, I'm, I kid you not, I had like 20 different coats. Because you guys leave your coats here all the time. 
And, and in fact, there's one right there on the couch that somebody left last week. And, and, and so it's like case in point, that's the most common thing people leave behind. And no matter how many times I'll leave it right where it was, thinking somebody will come back the next week and pick it up, that'll still be there when I leave today. And, and, and then no matter, no matter how many times I say something like, oh, get your lost and found, nobody gets it anymore. And so I finally just started doing this thing like six months ago when I cleaned everything out over the summer. I was like, I'm taking it to the downstairs lost and found area. I'm dumping it and somebody else can take care of it. And so some of you maybe walked by that lost and found in the foyer and your parents were like, that looks like a coat you used to have. You know, and you were probably like, oh, I don't know where that came from. And now that you mention it, I guess I am missing a coat, right? And some of you, you probably wouldn't even know. Oh, did I have that? Right. And, but, but we've all lost things before. When I was, when I was your guys' age, I, uh, you know, cell phones were more of a rarity. Um, not everybody had one. And if they did, it was, like, it was like a flip phone or one of those, like, like it, it looked like a big battery with a screen on it and buttons. And, and so I remember we were at Silver Dollar City, which was the, like, the theme park. Where, uh, where I grew up. It was like two hours from my house, and we were at the, the biggest roller coaster. It was, it was a new roller coaster at the time. It was called Wildfire, and it was awesome. You guys know those roller coasters that go from like zero to 100 in 2.5 seconds, and then like you drop down a slope and your stomach's up in your head, and then you like go in circles, and, and it's awesome, and you get the rush. Well, this was Wildfire. And so I remember waiting in line forever, getting up on Wildfire, and, and I remember my mom gave me her cell phone, so that if I needed to get a hold of her, I could just call my dad's cell phone from her cell phone. And so I had her, her phone in my pocket and I was wearing sweats, which was not a good idea because sweats don't grip things like jeans do. And so you guys know where this is going. You know the beginning of roller coasters where you go up, it's like. And you go up the little roller coaster thing. And then, so during that time, I didn't feel it, but my phone fell out. Or rather my mom's phone fell out. And I didn't notice it for like an hour. And so I realized, okay, I should probably meet up with my parents. So I'm reaching in my pocket. I'm like, and you know that like pit in your stomach that like happens? You're like, oh, I'm dead. Like, like the phone was gone. And, and, and I remember thinking, oh no. And I, I eventually found my mom and I was like, I lost your phone on wildfire. And it was one of those things where she's like, don't lose this. And she gave it to me. Mom, I lost your phone. And so it was one of those things we had, it was a big process. We had to go to like the wildfire station where like lost and founds are by the cubbies. And, and we had to fill out this form of like, you know, what, what it was. It was a Samsung flip phone and uh, it was silver and, uh, you know, had some black on the back and, you know, describe it. And, you know, thinking there's no way I'm ever getting that thing back. Two weeks later in the mail comes my mom's phone. And it still had a bar of battery left. So that's, that's the cool thing. When you don't have smartphones, there's nothing really that sucks the battery as much, especially when you know, you're not answering the phone. So it, it, it lasted. And it was, I remember being so ecstatic that we found the phone. They, they found it. They took our form seriously. I thought that was just like a thing they do to cover themselves legally. No, they actually went and found it, mailed it back. Oh, it was so great. And it was just that, that sigh of relief that I felt on the inside. You guys been that way? You, you've lost something, but you found it, and it's like, oh, yes. So, so how do you know whether, whether it's like you're, you're in the car with your parents, and, and you guys don't drive yet, so you don't experience this as much, but if you've been in the car, and maybe your car got lost, or your parents who were driving, they're lost. Or, or, or like one time I was driving downtown Kansas City and it was getting dark and we were in kind of a sketch part of downtown Kansas City. We're like, oh, I don't know where we are. GPS keeps rerouting us and I'm lost, right? How do you know when you're lost? How do you know? You don't know where you are. How else do you know when you're lost? You're going in circles. You, hey, I've seen that before, right? What else? You can't get back to where you started. You don't know where you came from. So you don't know where you came from or where you're going. Got anything else to add? You don't have anyone to call. You don't have anyone to call. You so no help, no backup. Uh, you don't know where you came from. You don't know where you're going. You don't you don't recognize your surroundings. Maybe you're going in circles. You know you're lost. You don't know where you came from. Don't know where you're going. It's a terrifying feeling. And, and, and when you're lost, like and that terror kind of comes over you. You know, it's it's like. It's like, what, what do I do? And you feel helpless, right? How many of you have actually, you've been lost in a situation like that? Maybe it wasn't driving, maybe it was like Camp Allendale and you were lost in the woods somewhere and you didn't know where the trail was because it's massive and confusing. How many of you have been lost before? 
Okay, so like, how, how does that make you feel? I'm Mr. Counselor now. Like, how does that make you feel when you get lost? I'm really scared. Yeah. So it's, it's not a good feeling, right? Okay, so, so we've all been lost. We, we know how it feels. It doesn't feel great. But, but here's the thing. Sometimes you and I, we get lost spiritually or emotionally as well. And how do you know if you're lost spiritually or, or, or emotionally? You don't know how you got to where you are. You don't know where you're going. Maybe, maybe you feel a roller coaster of emotions and you don't know like how you got to where you feel so icky. Or you don't know how you got to where you felt so anxious or depressed or whatever it is. And you, you find yourself at this point and you're like, how did I even get here? And it's not like physically, but it's like inside. How, how did I get to where I am today? And it's a terrifying feeling. You know, maybe you feel lost because of a circumstance in your life that you, you, maybe you, your parents got divorced or a boyfriend or girlfriend broke up with you or, or something happened. You, maybe you, you failed the test that you thought you aced and it really like kind of caught you off guard. And, and, and maybe the circumstance, maybe that's what made you feel lost. Maybe you felt lost because of a choice that you made that maybe you immediately regretted or you knew going into it it was going to be risky because if you got caught, you're going to be in trouble that you chose to do it anyway. Maybe, maybe it's a choice that you made and not, you just feel lost. Maybe, maybe you're stuck where you are. You can't change the present. You can't change anything and you just feel like you can't get anywhere. You don't know what to do to get out. Maybe you feel lost because you think you're unseen, unnoticed, or unloved. And, and those are all terrifying feelings to feel that it's hard to... to Kind of catch your bearings and know where you're supposed to go when you feel so lost. And, and here's the thing. When Jesus started teaching to people, he didn't teach in just the, the kind of the, the way you probably are used to when like teachers teach to you at school or even sometimes when I teach to you here. Like Jesus knew he was a master teacher, master communicator. And he taught in ways that people remembered, the, in ways that were worth repeating. And so you guys know, like, I can capture your attention. I can tell by the way that you guys are looking and leaning in that I've got your attention if I'm telling a story. And Jesus knew this too. And he told stories called parables, which were earthly stories with a, a heavenly meaning or a spiritual meaning or a, a deeper meaning beyond just what you see every day. It goes beneath the surface of what's actually happening in the story. And Jesus told these parables to catch people's attention and to change their perceptions on who God is and what he wants for them. And so when it came to lost things, people felt lost all the time. People felt lost, you know, spiritually, emotionally. They didn't know where God was. They didn't know what they were doing. And, and, and so Jesus starts telling this story in Luke chapter 15. He starts talking about, you know, a, a lost coin, a woman who lost her coin. And, you know, she, she looks all throughout the house to try to find him. She finds it. She rejoices. She, he tells a story about the, the sheep and a shepherd who has not 100 sheep. One goes lost. He leaves the 99 in the open field to go and find the lost sheep and bring it back. And then he goes on to tell this next story story about many of you probably heard it but it's about a father and his two sons and he starts telling this story and he, just, he goes you know there's a father he, who had lots of land he was a wealthy guy had, had lots of animals lots of crops lots of people working for him servants he was he was like present day millionaire okay and and, and he was a wealthy person and he had two sons and one worked really hard and and and, and made his name as, as a loyal and obedient son and the other son was not. He was a little bit of a troublemaker. He wanted to do his own thing. He didn't want to just do what the rest of his family was doing. So he comes up to his dad and he says, Dad, I know that I have an inheritance whenever you die. He goes, can I just, I'm tired of waiting around for you to die. Can you just give me my inheritance? Like now, right? And, and at this point, Jesus' audience, he's, he's talking to both people who are religiously elite, people who like, like always did the right things, probably people who are more like the older son. And, and, and they're going, oh, that father must disown him now because he has brought him shame, right? And, and they're thinking of all the things that the, the dad needs to do and, and the, everybody else, the sinners, the tax collectors that are sitting there listening to Jesus' story, they're going, ooh, what's he going to do? Why would the son ask such a thing? And, and, and so Jesus goes on to tell the parable and he says, because uh, the son's basically wishing he's dead, but the father complies. He says, okay. He just gives him the money. Gives him his inheritance early. And you know that the older brother was over there working in the field and looking and going, what? Maybe he was doing dishes and he heard this conversation behind him in the kitchen and 
he's laughing to himself. He's like, now the son, now my brother's going to get what he deserves for asking such an audacious question. And then he goes, okay, here you go. And you could probably hear like the, the older son break the glass, turn around, what? You're going to give him his inheritance? He does. So what's the son do? The text says he goes out and spends it all on wild living. It's like, it's like somebody who doesn't know how to manage money suddenly wins the lottery and they don't know how to manage money, so they go out and they just blow it all off and they lose everything. And, and so the son finds himself in this place where he's just like, he's lost all the money. In fact, a famine hit the land, which means there was a drought. It means that you know resources were scarce and, and there's there nothing else to eat. There's nothing else to do. And he had spent all his wealth. And the friends that he made because of his wealth, that he thought were friends because they liked him, had gone away because they just liked him for the party. They just liked him for the good time that he brought. So when his wealth dried up, so did his friends. And he's out there and he, he starts working for some guy just feeding slop to pigs, which is the lowest of the low. In fact, pigs, when Jesus is telling this story, pigs are unclean animals. They're like the things you don't, you don't, you don't eat pigs, you don't do anything with pigs, they're unclean. And so the fact that he was serving pigs, Jesus is saying, this guy had hit rock bottom. He had not only brought shame against himself, against his father, but he also brought shame against God. That he's not even worthy for anything else except to feed these unclean animals. And so this is where we pick up in the text today. That here in Luke chapter 15, Starting in verse 20, he, he decides, you know, and he starts preparing the speech. And he goes up and he's like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to maybe go back to my father and, and I'm, I'm going you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to just, you know, try to, to, to convince him to not even, like, take me back as his son, you know, which the father couldn't do, like, socially. If the father took him back, then this was, this was like, the father was bringing sh even more shame upon himself. He wasn't going to, like, he, he was going to lose respect in the community. It was, it was bad news that the father actually took him back because he was rewarding that behavior. And so the son starts preparing the speech. Maybe I won't even be taken back as son, but maybe I'll just be his lowest servant. Because then at least I know I'll be fed working for my father. So he starts preparing the speech. He's, he's, he's coming home. And as, as he approaches his father's house, this is what happens. This is the text in Luke chapter 15, verse 20. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with what? He was filled with what? Passion. Not anger. Not how dare he show his face here again. Right? None of that. He's, his heart is filled with compassion. He ran to his son threw his arms around him and kissed him. And, and, and just so you get the picture of this, this is, this is remembering honor and shame culture. The father, in order to run, would have had to hike up his robe and start running in, in order to greet him. And, and this is also a shameful, you don't do that. If you're a person of status especially, you don't, you don't disgrace the people around you by doing that and running. But he does. He doesn't care about his own. He, he has no regard for how people think about him. He just goes to show compassion to his son and accept him back and hug him and kiss him. And you know the son's like overwhelmed, like I don't even know why he's doing this, right? And so he starts, you know, probably I'm sure, like he, he starts to tell his speech and he says, Father, I've, I've made mistakes and the father interrupts him. He interrupts him. A couple of verses later he says, um, he, he takes him back and he decides to, to kill the fattened sheep and, and, and make, a, make a part, which meant basically we're going to take the best that we have. It's like going to the, you know, we're, we're not going to go to the freezer and pull out some taquitos to, to feed for everybody. We're going to go to B-dubs and cater in like the best wings you've ever had, that kind of thing. Maybe Chick-fil-A because it wasn't Sunday. And so he, he, he orders the best food and he, he kills the fat calf in honor of the son who is now returned. And, and, and here's, here's what he says in verse 24. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost, but now he's found. See, the father simply celebrated the fact that he was found. And you know his audience was like, that was the twist to the story. Like the first twist was that the father actually gave him his inheritance. The second twist was that the father actually accepted him back after blowing all the money, doing stupid things, and after dishonoring his whole family, he comes back. And when Jesus is teaching this to his audience, 
there's different people in the audience, like the Pharisees and the religious leaders who are going, that's, that's not right. You know? And you've got the sinners and the tax collectors on the other hand that are going, this is actually a comforting story because it means that there's hope for me. Right? And Jesus told these stories and these parables in such a way that everybody in the audience could relate to somebody in the story. And, and some of you, maybe you relate to, to the son, to, to the son who, who went and, and blew everything, made mistakes, and maybe you wonder if God would even have you back anymore after the mistakes that you've made, after the choices you've made, after all the things you've done. But what I want you to know is that God loves you and he loves us no matter what we've done. He loves us even when we're lost. He just wants us to turn to him for help. It, it, it doesn't matter where you've been or what you're doing and what you've done before. What matters is that you turn to him for help in the midst of the mess that you find yourself in at times. And so maybe, maybe you relate to that, to that younger son. You know, maybe, maybe you relate to the older son. And you think, like, how could God ever accept somebody like that? How could I invite someone like that to church, right? That person doesn't belong here. Right? You may, maybe you have people in your class that you just don't want to associate with. You've kind of written them off. And maybe you've done, like, the good things. You've, you've been obedient. You've not made any huge sins, you know, just little ones that nobody really knows about. And so maybe you think you're somehow better. But the point of the story, because the son, the older son, he doesn't go to the party. He doesn't celebrate. He gets mad that, that the younger son is rewarded for coming home. And so who are you in, in that story? Are you the older son or are you the younger son? The point is that God loves you even when you're lost. And he'll be waiting for us with open arms every day, every time. Every time we feel like we don't deserve it anymore. So uh, a couple things I, I want you to do to remember this. First, I, I want you to, to look around and recognize where you are. Because when we're lost, we don't know where we are. We don't know how we got here. We don't know where we're going. But I want you to first recognize where you are. Uh, be honest about, about maybe why you feel lost. If that's where you're at, be honest about why you feel that way. What kind of led you to feeling this way? And then I want you to remember what God wants for you, which is to be found. He wants you to be found, and he wants you to just turn to him. Because God loves you even when you're lost. And finally, I want you to tell somebody about where you are right now. Who do you relate with in this story? You'll, you'll talk about this in small group. Do you relate to the younger son, or do you relate more to the older son? But, but tell someone about where you are right now. And remember that God loves you even when you're lost. Even if you don't feel lost right now, there's going to be a day where maybe you feel a little lost, where you don't know what God is trying to do in your life or what he's trying to say to you. You don't know what's up. But when you feel lost, remember that God still loves you even in that situation. So as you go to your small groups, think about this question. What's one reason I might feel lost right now? Think about that question. I'm going to pray for you guys. I'll go to your small groups, and then we'll be done. Hey, hope you enjoyed this video. If you liked it, give it a thumbs up and make sure you're subscribed so you're notified when we upload future videos. Have a great day.